Hello? Yes, much better. Okay, let's start again. Good evening, everyone, and uh, I'm glad you're here for this evening's Bible study. We will do what we normally do, and I, I will review what, what we went through this morning. We were in Exodus 22, and we'll address any kind of questions or uh, statements you want to make, and then we'll turn it over to Brother Earl, who is going to lead us through our Bible study this evening. So, with that being said, we were in Exodus 22 and started with verse 16, and uh, there's, the first thing we did was try to talk about what holds this passage together, and quite frankly, it's, it's difficult to see. These are called sundry laws or sometimes miscellaneous laws, but I think there is a, a thread that, that does hold these together. And that's the idea that it's, it's speaking in marriage terms with God. And some of the ways you make this connection are dealing with idolatry and adultery as, as our relationship with him as a community being one of marriage, um, the, the breaking of that marriage, the preparing for that marriage, and how that marriage needs to look as we interact with one another and with God. And so with that being a bit of a perspective here, we looked at, at, these, at these passages. The first one had to do with verses 16 and 17 that dealt with a, a situation of premarital, um, premarital sex between two people. And this, uh, we first of all said what it wasn't. It was not somebody being indentured, the woman being indentured to somebody else. It was also not a rape situation, but it was just, in fact, two, two people who had uh, consensual premarital sex. It does put the, create a problem culturally, and we talked about what ha, how, what that problem was, how the dowry fit into that, and why why the money was was important in this conversation, and also uh, the options available to them. The young man uh, could, in fact, step in and be the husband or the proposed husband if he wanted to. He was able to do that. Either way, he was going to pay money, but he could do that if he paid, when he paid money. But the father had the option of not having him as a son-in-law and, and not allowing him to, to marry his daughter. The, the next three verses were 18 through 20, and they had to do with different forms of idolatry. One was sorcery. One was bestiality. bestiality I can't say the word. Uh, bestiality, and the other one was... Um, sacrificing to another god. And we, we just went through these and showed how, how they were wrong. Um, the, issue in, the issue in sorcery is, of course, trying to get information or power from someone else from, but God. That would be supernatural ability to know something or supernatural ability to do something. And our passage ad addresses that in terms of, of idolatry. Sometimes it's also addressed in terms of uh, where you see Satan and demonology and that kind of thing going on, but that wasn't really here. I do think it's tied to Satan's original lie of offering something that God would not give. And so these, these people, these sorcerers, are trying to get something God does not offer, and, and uh, they're trying to get it through, through some off-brand spirituality of some kind or another. Um, bestiality is a habit uh, of practice of the Canaanites, the people around Israel. Uh, I gave you several examples of where that happened. And so the call here is not really a moral call that, that this is a, a bad kind of sex, though it is. It's sex outside of marriage and outside of humanity. Both are, are wrong. And, uh, but this is actually in terms of, of looking at fertility gods from the Canaanites and how they practice religion with those fraternity, uh, fertility uh, God's. <clears throat> it, is, uh, it is God saying that he will not be worshipped in that way um, and, and the people should not do that. Uh, idolatry is in 20 and uh, it just, no other gods before me. It goes right back to the, to the commandments, uh, one of the Ten Commandments. And we looked at different passages in which God, he said he is the only God. The, there is no one but him and that no one else should be treated like God. We should not uh, we should not address other deities. We should not seek from other sources the things that are only supposed to come from God. He is the provider of all we need, and going to other 
uh, relying on other things, uh, either in the creation or in the spiritual world, to provide that that only God can give is, is wrong. Then we went to talking about the, in verses 21 through 24, the, the oppressed, the stranger, the widow, and the orphan. And we talked about each of their plights in that civilization at that time. But quite frankly, some of these, some of these situations are true uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of cultures. I had two conversations after church about uh, widows and uh, some, of the, some of the problems widows have today with as much support as, as there is available within our culture. Uh, it's still a precarious place and still a place of danger. But one of the tests for Israelite spirituality was how these, these groups get treated within the culture. And we tracked down some places in the prophets in which they were not treated well. And um, we, we went in some details about what it meant to treat them well. Uh, some of this stuff was cultural, like, like the uh, garment that the poor man had uh, when we got to, to um, the financial burdening. That took place in verses 25 and 20, uh, through 27. The, uh, the taking advantage of somebody who is, in, who is needing money. Who, who gets a loan, who has a garment for collateral, and what that meant, and how, how the scriptures tell his, God tells his people how to deal with this situation, not to be a, uh, a pain for that person, not literally to bite them with interest. And so Israel was not allowed to charge interest to Israelites. And um, you couldn't hold the man's cloak overnight so that he couldn't sleep with it. We talked uh, then going on in 30, uh, 28 through 31, we, we talked uh, about the, the need to, to watch what you say about God, who is the authority, and the people to whom he gives authority, which is other rulers, and how this was a capital offense. I, I told you about one person who, in Leviticus 24, who that, that was a capital crime and he was executed. We talked about uh, what Romans 13 says about honoring those who are in, in public leadership over us and recognize that that was dealing with bad leadership of, of, a, uh, of a Roman emperor who had no Christian connections at all. We also looked at a portion of Acts in which Paul uh, spoke harshly to somebody and uh, he, he later recognized he was doing that to an authority and he quoted our passage and said he should not done, have done that and, um, and confessed that as, uh, at that time. 29 and 30 were talking about giving to God. And uh, a couple points that I brought out in there is that, um, that, that this is a response to God's initial and, and large giving to us that we respond with thanksgiving and a portion of what he's given us. This portion is... is uh, representative of the whole. It's the first portion, and, and it's immediate in this, in this passage. And this is not, uh, we don't put God off until we have the means to do better by him, but we give out of what, what we have, and we give, we give when it first comes in. It's a priority in giving, and it's not leftover discretionary. And so um, I was thinking about this, you know, the that giving at first, it's a commitment that you're going to have faith in God that what, what you retain is going to be enough to get you through. It would be easier if you said, well, let me, let me do this at the end of the month once I see how far the paycheck goes, and then I can give. But this is saying when the paycheck comes in, give, trusting God to see you through the rest of the days that you need with whatever money he decides to give you. And so that, that's an act of faith in and of itself, the timing of it, I think. The last verse was kind of a strange verse in which uh, Israel was told not to eat, not to eat food that, uh, not to eat meat that wasn't that wasn't killed properly. And uh, the example of of coming coming across a carcass of an animal and not eating it, uh, it that wasn't really Israel's food laws don't have uh, anything to do with with uh, issues of healthiness. They're never claimed, there's no claim to be uh, rooted in that at all. Uh, a lot of people like to investigate that sort of thing, and they, you know, I've, I've seen claims that, 
if you eat a kosher diet, you'll be more healthy than if you eat some other kind of diet. And that may or may not be true, but it's not what the argument is in Scripture. And um, so it's, it's not based on health. And in this case, it's just based on holiness. God wanted his people to act and be differently than other people. And he says, he says at the beginning of the passage, he wants them to be holy. Um, that means, in this case, that they're going to kill animals, drain the blood. He gives instructions for that later in Scripture. But they're not going to walk up on an animal, find that it's dead, and try to eat the carcass in some way or process that, that meat for themselves. Um, to show that this is not a health issue, they were allowed to actually process the meat and give it to somebody uh, who was not an Israelite. <coughs> and so if they wanted to sell it to one of their foreign neighbors uh, who might be there or give it to them, that they were welcome to do that. Uh, God allowed them to do that. And so then I um, pulled back and just sort of made some observations as I have been in this section uh, from this sermon. And the first observation <coughs> was that God is interested in all of life. And when you look at the passages we were, we were talking about, it's, it's amazing how far into our lives that God has interest, that he's given instruction, that he has care, that he sets up holiness in a lot of different areas of our life. And uh, it's from the big to the small, from, from relationships, which are incredibly important, to things like your clothes, in this case, or, or that are not that important. And uh, the words we use, every, everything about us, God is, God is interested in all of life. And uh, there's, there's no, I, I said something like, there's no part of us that he is not concerned in, that we can keep private from him, and, and he does not have lordship over. The second... The second point was that um, being God's people is high stakes. And what I meant by that was looking at the high cost of, of idolatry uh, with sorcery, bestiality, and, and idolatry. And um, following God is a serious matter. And though we don't, though we don't have capital punishment in the church today, uh, we, do have, we do have a situation in which we confront sin and we, we insist that people uh, give up their sin in order to remain in the community. We, uh, there's no sin that, that should not be eradicated and that um, there's a certain publicness to this as well in, in the sense that um, I was thinking, I didn't say this this morning, but if, if I understand there to be a problem in a marriage, you, you, know, you could say, that's none of my business, that's the marriage. However, as a Christian who is a brother or sister to one or both of those people in the marriage, it is on me to try to help them in some way to say something. And particularly if I think it's, it's sinful uh, in some way uh, to do that. And so even, even our private sins have public implications and get public help if, if uh, they become known. Um, the last th uh, of the three things was that God's people follow a holy God. And that was just to recognize that in all of this, each of these passages, there's a lot of imitation of God here. That we, our disposition towards people is because God has already established his disposition towards people. He knows what he's doing in these situations, and we are to complement and follow what he is doing in these situations. And so um, all, all through these passages, you see God acting in these situations and calling us to act in a, in a holy way as well. And uh, it, it just struck me that so much of who we are as Christians really is dependent on who God is as, as a God. And, and that in each of these situations, it doesn't really matter who the other person is. That's not going to determine how we, how we respond to them. What's going to de de determine how we act in that situation is who our God is. And I thought... Uh, that showed up a lot in this passage. So that's my review. Um, I'm going to open the floor for your comments or questions, and we'll see, we'll see what you were thinking about. Any, any thoughts, any questions along those lines? Yes. Um, what is the actual definition of sojourner? A sojourner is somebody who is um, not an Israelite, who comes in, not a Hebrew, who comes into eventually, eventually Israel. One of the things that's interesting about this is, is there are portions of this law code that we're in 
that are established with the idea of living in Israel, even though they haven't seen Israel yet and won't see Israel for a while. But, but the situation is such that um, it's laying down the groundwork of when you get to Israel, this is how things are going to work. Well, one of the ways things are going to work is when you have outsiders, people from other tribes, people from other nations, come into Israel, there are expectations of how they are going to live, there's expectations of how you're going to treat them. And they, they don't have citizenship, they may have long-term residency. There's basically about two common paths that, that foreigners might take. One is to come in and try to do some trading and uh, trade either their goods or pick up goods in Israel and trade or some kind of combination of that in which they're in for a while and then they leave in a while. Um, the other thing that happens is people can come, enjoy living in Israel, stay there and establish themselves, uh, usually in somebody else's housework, they're, they're a laborer for somebody else or something like that, um, and, and just stay there. But they don't have to become Jewish. They don't, have to, they don't have to convert. But their life is limited in what they can do by the social structure around them. They're not free to practice everything they want to practice, do everything they might do back in their home. They have to live a basically an Israelite life, and they live, they, they get to enjoy some of the benefits, but there are some things that they can't do as well. Yeah, I don't know what I said that made you feel that way or what the verse was that brought up those thoughts, but they were limited. Um, they were limited in, in what they could do. For example, eventually uh, tabernacle and temple access and that kind of thing was probably the biggest thing that they couldn't do. They had to keep, they had to keep laws uh, that, that Israel had for themselves. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure what I said, but... Don't take into account the um, the distinctives that God set up just to make His people very different from the other nations. Even if you don't take those into account, it seems like they were just vastly different from what I would think about justice in terms of the other nations at that time. Yeah, there. Um, one of the things that's kind of fascinating, <laughs> if you're if you're bent this way, I'm kind of bent this way, but looking at law codes and customs of the people around them and comparing and contrasting what that is. And, and, and there's two things. It'll amaze you how much they're similar and it'll amaze you where they're different as well. And um, certainly some of the dietary stuff. Um, sometimes what's interesting is like punishment issues. Like everybody thinks stealing is wrong. But, but what happens when you steal in this culture versus that culture? And and the results are, are different and, and sometimes interesting. Um, for example, in, 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 uh, if, if you were to look at, say, Hammurabi's law code at that time, which is actually a little bit before Moses's, but, but still in play at that time, um, it, who you stole from mattered. In other words, you know, if you steal from people who are the lower echelons of society, it wasn't that bad of a deal. You steal from somebody in the upper echelons and you could actually be executed for stealing. And so, um, of, course, of course, in Mo Moses' law code, it does not matter who the victim is. And so sometimes, sometimes it's interesting what's the same and what's different, to be honest. Yeah. But they, they were uniquely different in, in structure. The question really becomes, with a lot of this stuff, Earl, is, is how much of it did they practice like it was written? In other words, how much of this actually got done the way it was prescribed. And, and there's different, uh, you can see some of that happening in other, in other passages, you know, uh, narratives that tell you this is what happened and that's what happened. But there are some places where, where it's not clear how, how rigorous they obeyed uh, Moses' law. And in fact, the problem the prophets had was, was you, didn't, you didn't obey it enough. And um, Moses' law code is held up as an indictment against the people, and and uh, it was it was it was almost like like a uh, 
well, it was an indictment. The, the prophets would say, the Lord said this, you did this, you're breaking his law when Moses said this. And, and the law code actually becomes an indictment against the people because they didn't, didn't follow it like they should. Yes, upstairs. So, are you... Hello? Kind of hear you. Okay. Um, yeah. Are you aware of times where the Hebrews practiced Exodus 22-28 of not cursing a ruler on their people when they were in captivity to uh, other authorities? Other than the, the Am I aware of times where they cursed their leadership? Is where, that where they practiced this? I, 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 I guess, uh, you know, this was instituted when they were under the head of their own, uh, under Moses and the priesthood of Aaron. But were they practicing this at all when they were under, say, Canaanite rule or under Roman rule? Um, I, I tend to think they, they were really cursing those other leaders, <laughs> leadership and, and um, uh, authorities. And the reason I think that is because you have some of the writings at that time and even graffiti from that time in those places. And uh, they, they, did not, they did not enjoy captivity. <laughs> and um, whether it's Babylonian or Roman or, or Greek, I mean, there, there's, um, you know, what exists, you can see that, that they, were, they were very antagonistic about their, their overlords of different empires. Um, and, and most notably, probably the Maccabees, I would say. But yeah, so, go ahead. So with that, um, it understood that this was instituted under Moses and the priesthood, and they were not supposed to rule out them. However, they really felt differently when they were under other rulers. It seems like Romans 13 is not a direct correlation to this, but maybe it was something instituted apart from this. Or maybe this may be somewhat of a template, but there's not a one to one correlation. Um, well, I don't think Romans 13 is, is a quote of this or anything like that's not that direct. And, and Paul was very good, particularly in Romans, about quoting Old Testament passages. And so I think if, if he wanted to link the two, he would have done it a lot, a lot more clearly. But I do think that uh, thematically and the results are, are exactly the same. The other thing I would say, though, Darnell, about the first part of your question is they weren't particularly good on their own internal leadership. And like I said this morning, Moses might have been the most uh, vilified person around. He, he has trouble within, within his own family. Um, he, he, he is, uh, he really, he, there are times where Moses is, Moses just doesn't want to be around his own people. And um, uh, his, his leadership was questioned a lot. And so I, I don't think they did a good job of this from the beginning internally. And I'm not surprised that they had difficulty later externally with, with other leadership. And I'm not surprised that Paul has to address it again under Roman leadership. Shanice? The message was so good today, and it just made me think about, um, I know you can't like take what we hear and automatically apply it to us today, but just when you were talking about um, the, uh, when a, when a, woman and men sleep together outside of marriage. Um, that's basically a proof of the dereliction of duty of a father. And parenting now is just like you have a kid and you kind of let them do what they want to. The, that, the role of a parent outside of the church um, or a Bible-believing church is not taken seriously. And we can look around at our society and our world and see the result of that. We can see evidences of fathers not being who God calls them to be and not, I mean, like there used to be like a moral standard about what was acceptable and that's on the way. Yeah. Um, 
But that and then I mentioned to these this to you before, but I quoted you wrong. Ruthless and removing idolatry. That that was that was the yeah. that was really good. I appreciate it. Yeah. Let me let me comment a little bit about what you said uh, originally. You know, the the applying the applying of these to these things that we find in the Mosaic Law to us today. You do have to go through a certain amount of thinking to to actually do that. And and people have noted that you know that that we don't. I'm wearing a shirt. I don't know what it's made out of. I don't care what it's made out of. But I'm sure it offended part of the Mosaic Law by being poly blend or something like that. Uh, I can't remember what I ate today, but I probably did something I shouldn't have, according to Moses and that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden I say, however, we don't want to have premarital sex like, like Moses calls for. And, and you know, that, that has a very obvious ring of inconsistency about it. And um, so you, you can't just cherry pick what you want. And, uh, and yet, we do see that some of our moral stances, some of our moral uh, desires for ourselves and those around us um, have, have some roots in the Mosaic Covenant, or at least repeated. And, and how, do we, how do we get from that to where we are? That, that's, a, that's a full night worth of talking, and it's not tonight. And so, um, but I would say this, that, uh, that when you talk about something like premarital sex, that's, that, that is a, an ethic that goes throughout Scripture. And, and it's not based only in the Mosaic Code, it's based in other places, and, and um, it's a it's a value that should be held. Your point that there's a failure in parenting on this, I would say it's pretty notable from where I sit that parents haven't held that up as a high value for their children. Children have uh, used that silence to make their own decisions and do what they want to do. And I want to say the culture is set up so that's most likely to happen. Um, Everybody's encouraged by what they see, whatever, what's going on around them in that direction. And then the answer, the answer to premarital sex is marriage, really. And so if you're going to delay marriage, you know, I, I'm just guessing, okay, this is not in Scripture at all, but I'm guessing the two people in, the, in this situation, if somebody would have read this Exodus 22 passage in Moses' day, in their mind would have popped up two people who are, 16 years old, 15 years old, 17 years old, and the next conversation is, are you going to marry her? And the question to the father, will you have him as a son-in-law? Well, who, who today is ready to be married at 15, 16, 17? Nobody. In fact, we don't expect people to start thinking about marriage until 25, 10 years later, 27, 12 years later. And so our culture is set up for 10 years of potential frustration, potential sin, and we're just loaded by the culture for that. And one of the things I think that would be better is if parents encourage kids to get married earlier, you cut, you cut down on, <laughs> on the opportunity for premarital sex and other problems. So I think, I think it's, uh, there's, a, there's parental expectations and teachings, there's problems with children obeying what they know is right anyways, there's encouragement from the society around us, and then there's a structure that makes it too easy to have problems for too long, and that kind of thing. So, anything else? All right. Well, I'm excited to turn this over to Earl. Let me pray for us, and he is going to take us through uh, through the Bible study. Father, we're grateful for your mercy and kindness to us. It's, bringing us back here to be able to close the day. Looking at your word is a great thing. We ask that you would bless uh, our hearing. We pray, pray that you would bless Earl's uh, teaching. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.